Shalom Aleichem, everybody. Welcome to the Yibane Beit Midrash. Actually, we're not in the Beit Midrash. We have a Seger, a closure. So we're doing this totally on Skype, which we have over there to my left, I guess to your right. And um, we're on Skype. And before I begin, we're in Parshat, by the way, the Era, okay? Which is chapter 6 of Shmot, of Exodus. Before we start, I want to make a... I'm, I'm going to... I hope I don't regret this, right? A little bit of a, uh, let's not call it political, let's call it a public service announcement, okay? A public service announcement. And that is, we have to stand up against corruption. We have to, right? I said before the elections that you have to vote for the least corrupted politician, the one who's out to, uh, let's just say, drain the swamp, right? That's his uh, motto or whatever, and whatever he can do, Whoever you think would have been the one that would be interested in building the temple in Jerusalem, that would be, or financially backing it, that would be a, a great, uh, a great uh, possibility to, uh, as a candidate. But now things are a little bit crazy, and uh, unfortunately, much of social media and the different uh, mediums that we all use for communication is being censored now. So my, I'm going to just mention this without mentioning any names that basically there are many um, servers, you know, search engines. There are many, right? The alphabet soup is uh, unlimited, okay? So any, any of these search engines that are censoring, let's say, you know, the freedom of speech, let's leave it at that, and sharing our religious ideas could be, and probably is, the target, one of the main targets. So we have to do something about it. Now, I'm against a blanket boycott because I don't know if that's going to really help. But I would say make the suggestion, okay? Wherever, like we don't advertise, okay? So we don't help bring in revenue on these different things that we're using, right? Uh, you know what they are because you're on it, watching it right now. But we don't give them revenue. We don't pay them. We don't give them any money and we don't... Uh, ascribe to the advertising idea besides a Torah class should not be interrupted with advertising anyway so that's the first thing I want to mention that I think that a blanket boycott is, is only going to hurt us in other words you choose everyone has to choose their own way right to make a point you have to how you do it that's up to you but my suggestion is do not pay them any money whatever you can do not to support them financially I'm talking about the ones that are censoring until they get a hold of themselves and realize when they lose billions of dollars in, on the stock market that uh, this is not the way to go because this is a capitalist or at least a free market society and so that was really what I wanted to mention okay now if you thought that all of a sudden now you're being tracked and you weren't being tracked yesterday, uh, your head is in the sand, okay? So there's nothing new. There's nothing new except really the censuring. And that is a big problem. And if you could uh, let your congressmen, your uh, senators, your who, whoever, your elected officials, I know that there are countries now, there are counties and countries all over the world that are actually censoring them because they're not holding up to the bargain of the I'm not sure what amendment it is in the United States, it's called 230, which basically means they're a platform and not a publisher, and uh, therefore they should be held accountable. So that's my, that's, that's not political. <laughs> this is a, a religious right, yeah, freedom of speech. Okay, so in this week's Parsha, the Clea Car goes at length to describe the first verse in many different ways. Actually, I'll mention, he mentions four specific ways, and we're only going to focus on Derek Shani and Derek Shlishi. On the second and third out of the four ways. And that's where we're going to begin tonight, okay? So, for those on the Hebrew pages, it's Resh Nun Bet, Derek Shani, Behemshek Psuki Melu. You know what? Maybe I will give a slight, a very slight introduction to what he did speak about earlier. And that is when you look at the verse. Now, our Parsha begins in chapter 6, verse 2. Now, we will connect. 
that's what Derek Shaney is all about, is connecting it to the previous verse, the last few verses of last week's Parsha. But let's just read verse 2. God spoke to Moses and said to him, I am Hashem. Now, it's only in the Hebrew that you really understand what I'm talking about, and that's why I feel it's necessary to discuss this idea. Look in the Hebrew. V'yedaber Elohim el Moshe, v'yomer elav ani Hashem. The word v'yedaber, which just means to speak, and the word v'yomer is to say over, they're two different words. <laughs> in English, you would, all, you would almost just gloss over it and not know the difference. But v'yedaber is a harshness, almost like a judgmental, harsh speech, and that's what the name Elohim. Now, we're going to talk about the names of God, the UK Vavke, and the name Elohim specifically, also El Shaddai. Okay, we're going to pronounce it from this point on, Kel Shakai, so we know what we're talking about. Like the name Elohim. So Elohim is a judgment, so it was harsh sp speech by God, but we only know the traits of Hashem through his actions, okay? He's one, he's unbelievable, uh, like, uh, not unbelievable, of course we believe in him, but unknowable, right? It's very hard to comprehend the, the greatness of Hashem, but we only know him, we know him through his actions. So Elohim is an action of, it's a statement of a name that comes out in the attribute of judgment, and he spoke to Moshe, so it's V'yedaber Elohim El Moshe. But the rest of the verse is a fluch. It's like the opposite. V'yomer elav. The word v'yomer is a softness. Elav. He didn't speak to Moses. He spoke to him. Meaning the name and who he is are two different things. Because Moshe, it, and I'm just giving you some background to what we had spoken about in earlier part of this Parsha, that the name Moshe means a present tense drawing out of the polluted waters. It means the Redeemer, like present tense Redeemer, not redeemed. Okay, so Moshe is present tense, and God is judging him harshly because he did not understand his role, and he basically was saying, why me? You know, he wasn't really ready uh, to grasp his role. He was hesitant. But the latter part, it says, V'yomer Elav, Hashem has Rachmanut, Hashem has mercy. He says, Ani Hashem, I am Yudke Vavke. So, what he was, was a stutterer. He had a speech impediment, and therefore there is Rachmanut. Now that's the background, and now we're going to get into a serious discussion. Um, as I mentioned, it's only two out of four that we're going to talk about. So Derek Shani Behemshik Psuki Meiluhu. The first thing he mentions, look at the previous verses, right? If you go, I just have to pull it up real quick, right? Go back to Exodus chapter 5, verse 22, 23, 24, and read on till at least let's say chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. So let's just read it real quick, just in English. So Moses returned to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, why have you harmed this people? Why have you sent me? There's a hesitance. And he's also blaming Hashem for harming the people. Since I have come to Pharaoh to speak in your name, it only brought more disaster. He, has, he Pharaoh, has harmed this people. And you, God, have not saved this people. What's going on here? Moses doesn't know there's going to be ten plagues, and it's going to take a year. He doesn't have the patience. I don't understand. Since he brought this up to Pharaoh, it only became worse for the Jewish people. And the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. For with a mighty hand he will send them out, and with a mighty hand he will drive them out of, the, of his land. So we do see that, we're going to have to discuss this, this verse, this verse is actually the judgment. It's harsh judgment on Moshe. We'll see it, okay? Because Rashi's going <laughs> to Rashi's going to say that now you're going to see what I'm going to do to Pharaoh, but you're not going to go into the land of Israel to see what I'm going to do to the 31 kings of the seven Canaanite nations. And that's our verse begins. God spoke to Moses and he said to them, "I am the Lord." I skip for some reason the next verse, but let's do it anyway. He says, "I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and to Jacob as El Shakai." Kel Shakai, but with my name Yudke Vavke, 
I did not make myself known to them. Okay, so we're going to deal with a few more verses, but I wanted to show you these are the verses we're dealing with, and we're going to put them together. So this judgment of Vidaber Elohim El Moshe is somehow connect, and I am, and he said to him, I am Yudke Vavke, is connected to the previous verses. In what way? First thing to know, he says, is She'en Okim El Dayan, that the name Elohim always means and is none other than judgment, than a judge and judgment. Now there is a Gemara here that kind of discusses it, and that would be in Yuma 87a. Uh, I don't know how much part of this I want to read to you, but we'll, we'll go through it. Let's do it. So it was taught in a Mishnah regarding Yom Kippur, that Yom Kippur atones for sins committed against God. Now, of course, tshuva, you have to do tshuva, okay? If you don't do tshuva, even that won't help. Okay, fine. So, that's what, that's what it's set up for. Comes Rav Yosef Bar Chavu, and he raises a contradiction before Rabbi Abahu. And as he says, doesn't the Mishnah say, Yom Kippur does not atone for sins committed against a, f- a fellow human being? Yom Kippur does not atone, because it says... Now, this is an interesting verse, because in 1 Samuel, chapter 2, verse 25, and this is a misunderstanding, we're going to get to the clarity of it, but uh, Eli is upset with his sons because of what they did, meaning they held back uh, overnight certain uh, korbanot, specifically korbanot for women who had given birth, and... Uh, Basically, they were going to be okay to be with their husbands, and by holding them over one night, one extra night, which is unjust in itself, it's corrupt, right? There's some benefit to these guys. Well, guess what? Guess what? These women cannot be with their husbands because they're going to be held over in Jerusalem or near the temple, waiting for their their offerings to be uh, finished, and... um, it actually says that they committed adultery, but that's not what happened, okay? That's, if you look through the, the verses, it seems like what they did was much worse, and that's the way the Torah actually says a lot of times about certain sins are much worse, but they're not really, that's not what they actually did, okay? Like, I'll just give an example. King David did not sleep with a married woman. She was divorced, right? There's other examples. Okay, so the Gemara continues basically using this verse. And this is the verse we're going to examine. If one man sins against another, Elohim shall judge him. Now, the word for judging him is like the word lehitpalel, to pray. Uh, which actually means judgment. That's what tefillah, prayer is, self-judgment. But it says Elohim, and it also says like prayer or judgment. Okay, so we have to examine those two words, Elohim and judgment. If, however, the verse continues, he will sin against God, which the first part was sinning against man, the second part is sinning against God, who will intercede in the judgment on his behalf? But they would not hearken to their father's voice, for the Lord desired to kill them. Okay, by the way, if I mention it's in 1 Samuel, chapter 2, verse 25. Now the word, which may also refer to prayer, implies that if he prays, true, God will grant the sinner forgiveness. Okay. So what we're talking about, the first part of the verse, if you sin against another human being, all you have to do is pray. Didn't we just say that only if you, um, if you commit uh, sin against another person, Yom Kippur does not atone? Okay, but one second. If you pray, it will work. So... He answered him, no. What does it mean, who is Elohim? When it says Elohim in the verse, it's referring to a judge. So there are many names of Hashem. Some of them can be used in a secular way, like Elohim. Elo- if I use it as El- Elohim, it could mean a judge, not necessarily God. Like many of the names of God could be used for, i call it secular purposes, right? Chol, not Kadosh. Sometimes they're used for Hashem. There's only one name, and that's going to be Yud Kei which we're going to get into. That is never used in a secular way. In the meantime, at this point, basically, what do we understand? It's referring to a judge, not to God. 
And therefore the word Ufilu indicates judgment, not the name Elohim. In other words, he's trying to prove that Elohim does not mean judgment here. It means a judge. And therefore atonement occurs only after justice has been done toward the injured party by means of the court ruling. Now that's the first part of this Gemara. It continues, and that's where we're going to get into the, 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 the meat of the matter. So Rav Yosef Bar Huva said back to him, if that's true, if that's so, then say regarding the following, the latter part of the clause, but if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat him? Now again, the word, v'yitpaleo, who is going to pray for him? So this is difficult, since it has been established, the word palal, palal is the root of tefillah, and here, in this case, judgment, is interpreted in this verse as indicating judgment. And that's really what prayer is, by the way. It's self-inflicted judgment, right? You're judging yourself. And therefore, the latter clause of the verse implies that if one sins towards God, there's no one to judge him. That's what it sounds, because it's a question. So Rabbi Abbao answered him, this is what the verse is actually saying. That if one man sins against another, God himself will forgive him. If the sinner appeases the person against whom he sinned, which you have to do, otherwise you will not be forgiven. So if he does appease the person that he sinned against, he will be forgiven. Now what about if you sin against the Lord? But if a man sins against Hashem, who shall pray for him? Who shall yet palel? Who shall judge him, basically? And the answer is astonishing. It's repentance and good deeds. That's right, because what is tshuva? Tshuva is repentance, and therefore changing your deeds. Okay, that's what you have to do. So the word, the root palel, is to be interpreted as indicating forgiveness rather than judgment. So now we understand the latter part of the verse again. Going back, if, however, he will sin against God, who will intercede, who will forgive him? Obviously, it means that Hashem will forgive him, as it says, but they would not hearken to their father's voice. Look, that's a, a part of the verse I didn't want to read. But anyway, who will incede, meaning it's the good deeds, it's the repentance. That's the answer. Through good deeds and repentance, a person will be forgiven. Okay. Now, so we know Elohim means judgment. No question about it. But the truth is, it doesn't explain in our verses, if we're saying that Moses is being judged harshly, in what fashion, for what purpose, what did he do wrong? We have no clue from reading these verses, perhaps, again, even though we're connecting the previous few verses, and I kind of explained that there was some judgment based on Moses' statements to God, and that's what we're going to deal with. So it doesn't, it's not explicit. That's why the Kliyakar will explain it like this. That the judgment is coming on what was stated previously. And what was stated previously? God says, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Chazal tell us, and you can look in Rashi, Lo asui l'malche shivas umos. Let's look at Rashi real quick. It's on uh, six one, number 2 in the source sheet. See, basically because you have questioned my ways by Moses questioning. Now, what does he mean he questioned his ways? He said, what is your name? <laughs> Didn't he? Okay. So you questioned my ways of running the world. Not like Avraham. Did Avraham question Yitzchak, Yaakov, none of them, none of them questioned. In fact, they were in such predicaments because God promised them. He made a promise to them, and yet they didn't say, no, when's it happening? Well, it could be because he promised their seed. He didn't really promise them. But nevertheless, they had patience. They were, they believed, they believed, and they didn't quit. Their faith did not waver, okay? Moses, for some reason, had to know what is your name, where are your deeds, where are the actions, what's happening. We'll see it surely. Look again in that Rashi. You've questioned my ways of running the world, unlike Abraham, who I said, he actually said in Genesis 21 12, Isaac will be called your seed, he's going to inherit everything. And afterwards, I will bring him up there as a burnt offering. And then all of a sudden, now Abraham is told to, well, he doesn't know yet, 
whether he's to kill him or just offer him or go through the motions and then Isaac won't be saved, won't be killed. But how do you not question it? This is one of the ten tests of Abraham. He's told through your seed Isaac everything's going to come to be, everything's going to come to pass, all the promises. And what happens now? God says bring him up and Abraham doesn't say a word, right? It's just the beginning. Therefore you will, now God is telling Moses, now you will see what is done to Pharaoh, you will see. But not what is done to the kings of the seven nations. Keep this in mind. Rashi is only quoting part of the Medrash or part of the Gemara that says there are kings of the seven nations when I bring the children of Israel into the land of Israel. So that you will not see. Which infers at this point what? That already before the first of the ten plagues it's already been decreed that that Moshe will not enter the land which we'll have to deal with because later on we do know that as he is hitting the rock instead of speaking the rock right that he is actually told because of this you didn't sanctify me in front of the people that they should believe in me therefore you're not going to go into the land of Israel so that sounds like it happened much later that such a decree takes place. So again, we have to deal with that as well. And we will. Now, going back into the clear car, he says the word malache seems extra. Near yitur. Why do you have to tell me, you're not going to see what I'm going to do to the kings of the seven nations. What does that have to do with anything? Just tell me, right? All that God had to say was, you're not going to see what Joshua or what the Jewish people are going to do or what I'm going to do, Hashem is going to do to the seven nations in the land of Israel, in the land of Canaan. So there's a medrash that brings down specifically these words, the lo tires asher yaseb in mechemet shloshim v'chan malachim, that you will not see what's going to happen to the 31 kings. How do we know there were 31 kings? First of all, <laughs> you can go to the, uh, besides the Gemara we're going to read in St. Hedron 111a, you go to Joshua. In Joshua chapter 12, verses 9 through 24. And I, I implore you to look it up, because I'm only going to read the last verse. right? But starting at 9, it starts mentioning, again, it's chapter 12, verse 9, it starts mentioning all the kings, and says, here's one, another one, one, another one, 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 one. You can add up all the ones, but the Pusik does it for you. Uh, verse 24, all the kings are 31. So you have 31 kings, and that's in the book of Joshua. And we go on. Another question, Minyana Lamali. Why do I even need a number? Everyone, right? <laughs> Everyone can count. Right? We just had it in, jo in Joshua chapter 12. Anybody knows Tanakh knows there were 31 kings. What do we need the, to bring it up for? Another question, what does it mean when it says, as we, we described the verse, Auto with an ayin, now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Why do you need the word now? Auto, why do you need it? Lamali. This is what the clear card is describing, even though I described it, the actual language of now, uh, but I'm going to describe it a different way now. Okay. When God said to Moshe, Ani Hashem, I am Yud K Vav K. That's the Yud and the Hey. And the vav and the hey, what does that mean? What is the name of God? It's Hoya Hove Vihia. Past tense, I am all of the past, I am all of the present, and I'm all of the future. Which means what? Thank you very much. <laughs> I am all existence. Kikol Basar Vadam Eno Batuach Lekayim Haftachato. What it really means, this is God's signature of truth and that he is totally to be relied upon. When it comes to a human being, how can you ever trust anybody? Someone promises you something, how do you know it's ever going to be fulfilled? When a person promises, so then he goes to sleep and he says, you know, well, tomorrow, tomorrow, the next day, whenever it happens, it'll happen. 
right? And you don't know. Maybe it will be tomorrow. Maybe it will be the next year. You don't know when a person promises anything to you if it will ever happen. But when Hashem promises you, you know it will happen. I say, Hashem, you can love, okay? What is it about human beings? Take a look in Psalms 103, verse 16. This is, uh, the, the language he's using is based on this verse. Ki ruach of rabo ve'inein l'kayim haftachato. Because the spirit passes over him and he's not able to fill his promise. So the verse says, for a wind passes over him and he's no longer here. That idea of a human being is a mortal person. So once his spirit passes on, finished. With Hashem it doesn't work like that. al kain Tzarek L'Kaim Alta. The only way a person could be trustworthy is if every time he promises, he does it immediately. Otherwise, anybody can have a claim. A taina, a claim, no, when are you going to do it? V'im lo, if he doesn't do it immediately, azai bedin ha-muftachim korim tigar, because if a human being doesn't do it, then he certainly has, it seems like whoever would make, was promised anything, logic dictates that he has the right to complain. Al asher lo nase pitgam v'divro meira, on the fact that the, whatever the person said was not fulfilled immediately. Im, im ke because if it's not fulfilled now, when it will be fulfilled, you don't know? A big question mark. But God is telling him, I am I am eternal existence. I am Hoyvel's <laughs> existence for eternity. And to me, all times are the same. There's no difference between past, present, or future. That, we're talking about Hashem. It's like, how can we comprehend this? I mean, today in quantum physics, quantum mechanics, and they talk about multi-universes and possibly like that, maybe it gives us a little bit of an insight, a little bit of a possibility of perhaps what it's talking about. Because of this, because of what? The faith that our forefathers had, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they didn't complain. They trusted and they believed. They anticipated the fulfillment of God's word. They really believed in the end it would, it would become fulfilled. But you, Moshe, you come and complain. Al shalom niskaimu divarai taketh umiyad. This is what God is speaking to Moses and saying, but you are unlike them. Your complaining already didn't happen so fast. And if that's the case right now, that you're complaining, this whole process of 10 plagues is going to take anywhere between 10 and 11 months, something like that. I, I can only imagine what's going to happen to you when you go into the land of Israel, the land of Canaan, and have to fight 31 kings, and it's going to take seven years. It's going to take how long? Close to seven years. Take a look at Joshua chapter 11, verse 18. Just an example. The Torah says, Joshua made a war, made war a long time with all these kings. Yamim Rabim also Yoshua. It's called Malachim. Now, there's a reason for this. Why should it take a long time? Look at Exodus chapter 23, verse 29 through 30. Let me just read the clear car first before we go on to it. We just read the, the, the verse in, in Joshua chapter 11, verse 18. It wasn't really possible. It wasn't in the cards, let's say. It wasn't possible for the Jewish people to conquer the land of, of Canaan quickly. Lest, God forbid, it become filled, the land become filled. If it's empty, how many Jews were there? We have, let's say, three million of us, whatever it is. And the land, the, the, the borders of Israel were very large. So most of the land would be filled with dead bodies. Who's going to bury them? The wild animals, the lions, the tigers, and the bears would come. And uh, who knows what else, the vultures, the hyenas. But rather, ma'at ma'at But little by little, little by little, slowly by slowly, then we would conquer the land. 
as I said, look in Exodus chapter 23, verses 29 through 30. God himself says, I will not drive them away from before you in one year. It's not going to happen so quickly. Lest the land become desolate and the beasts of the field outnumber you. I will drive them out from before you little by little until you have increased and can occupy the land. Which is not what Moses' uh, temperament was at the moment. Ya'an, kidarchecha, likro tigar. Now God is still speaking to Moses, basically saying, because you are, I will just add the word impatient, but that, he doesn't say that yet. Yet. He says, because your way is to complain. Kesheen haftacha naaseis mehera. When the fulfillment of the promise is not fulfilled quickly. Akin ani konesecha. Therefore I, God, am going to penalize you. I'm going to punish you. A kenas is a penalty, a, uh, a punishment. Shebedin lo tireh hamilchama arucha shirteh im shloshimechan malachim. The reason I'm going to give you this kenas, this punishment, because the, jin, the, 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 the logic dictates, the judgment is that you will not see the war, this long, drawn-out war with the 31 kings. Chutz. Chutz, except for the Milchemet Paro, the fight, the war that we have with Pharaoh. He is one king to whom Melech Echad, he's just one king. That I'm going to allow you to see. That you're going to see right now. Meaning to say, Ratzol Amar, Tekev. Tekev means immediately. Asher Esa Lefaro. Then you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Osa Levad Tira. That alone you will see. The Iker Hamiyut Ba Milas Ota. The whole uh, deduction, the way we're able to explain this is because of the word now. Now. That's what it means. Not right now. Right now. And right now is also quickly. I mean, it has two con continent, uh, it has two, it connotes two ideas, right? One is now in time, and it also means quickly. But you will not see that which is not done now. That means in time. Only uh, that's something that would take a long time. That, that you're not going to see. Like the war that took place with the 31 kings. Ota Lotira. That you will not see. Now, when he says, My name is Yudke Vavke, Shmi Hashem, Hamayrishani Chayvil and Etzach. That reflects who I am and my actions. But the truth is, I said, that is the one name that actually is beyond actions. But for now, all we know is Yudke Vavke is, was, is, will be. It also means that he is eternal existence, and therefore, sof haftachti this kayem. In the end, anything that I promise, anything that I say, will be fulfilled. Avaladayin lo yadu davrzeh. But for some reason, remember, because he's only introducing himself now as Yudke Vavke, he says, well, I don't know, we saw this in previous verses, but anyway, we're going to deal with it, that I did not reveal, oh yeah, that's the next verse, sorry. That I did not reveal myself. I did not make myself known to them. I only appeared to them as Kal Shakai, but I didn't make myself known to them as Yudke Vavke, which we'll deal with. But the idea is that I didn't fulfill my promises, so they never really got to experience the fullness of what Yudke Vavke actually stands for. But he says like this, But they didn't know this. They were only anticipating, looking forward to my, my word being fulfilled. Okay, so let me just see. There was a few ideas I wanted to bring down before we go on. And that is the Gemara that's brought down in Sanhedrin 111a. Um, I, kind of, I kind of went through the whole idea. Um, but just know that it's in the Gemara itself. Look at the very end of it. The verse then states, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. One can infer the war with Pharaoh and his downfall, you will see. But you will not see the war with the 31 kings in Eretz Israel, as you will not be privileged to conquer Eretz Israel for the Jewish people. I want to go to... I have some interesting things that I pulled out. I 
I want to go to the Ben Yehuda. Only because I love I love his explanations. But I have a whole bunch more to go through. And now I'm realizing we're not I don't know if we're gonna to get to part Derek Shlishi, because there's just so much to say. So let's go to the Ben Yoda. And that is, by the way, the Ben Ishchai. And he brings down our verse, chapter 6, verse 1, that says that the Milchamas, well, it's not the verse, it's from the Gemara. This is a comment on the Gemara. That when it says the war of Paro, you will see. The war with Pharaoh, you will see. But you will not see the war with the 31 kings. So as he always says, B'siyata d'shmaya, near li b'siyata d'shmaya, it seems to me with the help of God to be able to explain, shenola davar zem mikoach shenitra'am al hayasurim, that what really, this whole idea was born, this whole idea that God, that Moses will not be able to see what's going to happen there, is because he was pained by what he saw, right? He was God even said, I'm going to go down, and we're going to bring the Jewish people out. And, and things were made worse, right? Like, now you're going to have to get your own straw. And what happened, uh, we'll talk about some of the details, Bezrat Hashem. Uh, but the pains were increased. So here we say like this. It was, this idea was born out from the power of his crying out because of the pains that were added on the Jewish people. And he cries out and he says, you're only making it worse for these people. Vahatzel lo hitzalti et amecha. These words are very important because in Hebrew you wouldn't know it from the English, right? What does the English say? You have not saved your people. Well, it says hatzel. This salvation lo hitzalti. You did not activate for your people. That's a pretty big accusation for Moses to make. So the Ben Yoda says, Ki COVID, I, I, I think this is absolutely unbelievable. The word being used is COVID. That's what the Hebrew says. I'm not making it up. Ki COVID ha'avoda shenoisef alehem. That the heaviness of the servitude, COVID means heaviness in context of the servitude that was added upon the Jewish people the first time around, that was actually good for them. Rabbi Breiter would spoke about this, and I'll just try to, uh, if, I'll try to explain. We were told we were going to be enslaved for 400 years, but we were only there for 210. By the time the 210th year rolled around, we were already the 50th level of impurity and tuma, which meant that if we reached the 50th, did I say the 49th? If we reached the 50th, we would not, we'd be unredeemable, irredeemable. I'm sure there's a better word. <laughs> okay, we would not have been able to been redeemed. So Hashem quickened it. What is it? How can He quick? How can He just take 400 years and bring it down to 210 years? Right? How can that be? He promised, right? It was because there was a certain necessity of whatever shibud, a subjugation, was necessary to become a nation. So he quickened it by making it harder. I mean, you have to see that even in the COVID, <laughs> the COVID, the harshness is actually going to bring about the redemption, right? When we experience the added weight of um, of yisurim of difficulties. That's not always a bad thing. Okay? I hope I'm getting this message across. It's not always a bad thing. In fact, if it's coming from Hashem, it's never bad. Now, so by adding the, or making it more harsher, right? The, the servitude harsher, then we can leave in a shorter amount of time. So that's what was happening. But we weren't really there yet. So as Moses then speaks to, to Pharaoh, that we're going to take them out basically very soon, that in order that for that to happen, now, if it, that would have happened, in other words, if we're supposed to be in servitude for 400 years under the Egyptians, which has a certain amount of weight, right, again, the word COVID, right, a certain amount of weight of uh, difficulty, so if that didn't happen, it would open the door for 
the Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome, and include inside Rome the Ishmael. So if we would have been able to survive the four, full 400 years without being descended down to the 50th level, if we would have been able to stay not you know on the 49th level or beyond, then that would have been game over. We would have come to Eretz Israel, and there wouldn't have been any extra galut, any galiot, any extra exile. Okay, so in a certain sense, this was, um, how do I explain it? This was to our good and our detriment. It was to our benefit and to our detriment. Okay? So now, he says like this. I'm going to read the words exactly. Because of the ad additional weight of servitude that was added on us the first coming, that that was actually to our benefit because it helped complete the time that remained from the 400 years that we were supposed to be in servitude. Again, that word, COVID, that that additional weight, whether it was five or six months, that would be able to complete the entire time and if we would able to if we would have been able to spend another five or six months in Egypt we would not have had any more exiles ah however I lost my place But because Moses cried out on our behalf and felt the pain by saying, You're making it worse for these people. That you're, you didn't save them. The saving was not a saving. That's when God sent Moses, his chosen one, to for a second time go to Pharaoh. Go again to Pharaoh. I gotta keep my finger on the place. And then through him, through Moses afterwards, that's when the plagues began. The Kevan Shishilu Hamachos Paska Avoda. But guess what? So as soon as the Makos begin, the servitude ends. Not that we're not under servitude, but the hard labor actually ended when the when the uh, the plagues began. Just like Hazal tell us, Kevan Shildolo Nashlim Hazman, because that four or five extra months was not used. We didn't we didn't stay there for the full amount of time, whether it was four hundred years or the extra four or five months to complete the time. Hazman Nigzar Shibud Machius. This is the reason that we're going through the um, the plagues. Uh, sorry, the the um, the exiles of those four kingdoms I mentioned: Babylon through to Rome. And she Kevan she Galo Hutrak Moshe Rabbeinu Hashemli Pater Midbar. And it was because of this idea that that we would end up being in our own, in exile because we didn't fulfill the whole four hundred years in Egypt. That Moses, it was necessary for Moses to die in the desert. And not to enter the land of Israel. That if Moses would have entered the land of Israel, now what he's about to say, I have to try to explain. I will I'll give another explanation of my own that I've heard. Basically, let me tell you that one first because that one makes more sense to me. That if Moses would have come into the land of Israel and built the temple, just like David, if David would have built the temple, besides the fact they share the same soul of Mashiach, that temple could never have been destroyed. The concept, the name of the temple is called a Mishkan, right? Mishkan means the dwelling place for Hashem, but it also means Mishkon. Same letters, it means a guarantor, collateral. That the Mishkan is collateral for the Jewish people. That if the Jewish people would sin and worthy of being destroyed, that the temple was the Mishkon, it was its 
uh, guarantor. It was its collateral that it would be destroyed instead of us. Can you imagine now that if Moshe would have built the temple, that temple that he would have built with his own hands could never have been destroyed? Then what would have happened? God forbid, we would have been destroyed. So, see, it was all for our good. The way that the Ben Yehuda explains that if Moses would have entered the land of Israel, Hayuboyim al Kivro, Vitzoakim, they would have gone to his grave. They would have known where his grave was. He would have been buried in Israel at some point. And they would have cried out, that they would have prayed, that they, they would have cried out to him for Moses to pray, and to get rid of the exile. And it was all because of this. God did not want Moses to come into the, into the land so that he would not be buried here, so the Jewish people don't cry out to him to pray on their behalf that if Moses would have prayed, the exiles would have been, um, would have been negated. And that's not necessarily a good thing. Okay? Uh, and that's why he did not see the war between, of the 31 kings. Venera de Zachar. Now this is the Remez. This is going to be a very nice hint. Because when it says in the Torah, right, La Amazeh Hitzalta, the Hatzel, Lo, Lamed Aleph, Lo Hitzalta, the saving, not you saved, right? That's the literal, right? Meaning you didn't save your people. Lamed Aleph is what? 31. That basically he goes like this the Zacha Minyana. It specifically mentions 31 kings as a hint to what it actually says. Lo hitzalta es amecha. You did not save your people. This is what Moses, remember every punishment is always measure for measure. There has to be very significant um, signs of what you did wrong in order to fix the sin through the yesurim, through the punishment. We don't, punishment's not really a good word, but through the through the consequences of your actions, in order to fix them, there is a measure for measure. So the very fact that he says, Moses, the one that says, Lo, it's like, Lo, you did not save your people. The word Lo is Lamed Aleph, which is 31. So Garim Lo, that actually caused Moses himself to not see the Lamed Aleph. By saying Lo, you did not save your people, that was measure for measure, he would not see the 31 kings that are hinted in the let in the word low. Okay, now what I do think, maybe I should stick to the original plan. I won't go through all my my. Um, oh, there's so much good stuff here. Okay, let me let me do this a little bit. And we may not get to. Okay, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. In the meantime, I want to do some of the comments on the Gemara because. Wow, let me just tell you the concepts here. Like, what is the difference between the name Kal Shakai and Yud Kevavke? And what's the difference between Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Moshe? Right? There's got to be some real issues here. Okay. So in the Gemara that we spoke about, did we? Oh, you know what? I didn't, I didn't do the beginning. Maybe we should go back to Sanhedrin 111a. So, Rabbi Lezer, son of Rabbi Yossi, he says... And one time I entered Alexandria of Egypt, and he found an old man. And the old man says, come, I'm going to show you what my ancestors, meaning the Egyptians, did to your ancestors, the Jews. Now, some of them drowned in the sea. He's talking about the Jewish people. Some of them killed with the sword, and some of them were crushed in the buildings. Now, what does he mean he's going to show them? So the comment says he's going to show them through the Sefer Zichronos meaning a book of chronicles he's going to read and there are there are um, i don't know they have stone um, i don't know what they're called but they there are archaeological finds with uh, descriptions of what the egyptians did to the jewish people okay now one of the ideas that we brought up in this Gemara, which I don't know if we got to yet, let's see, it's 14, sorry, here it is. So when he, God says, you know, the, the forefathers never asked, let's just go through it. 
See, Moses protested the affliction suffered. This is what Moses, this Egyptian guy is telling the Tana, Rabbi Lezer, son of Rabbi Yossi, what the Egyptians did. And this is what Moses was so upset about. He really was upset that his mission maybe fumbled things, uh, made things worse. As he was punished for this word, since I came to speak to Pharaoh in your name, you have done, right, the, the Pharaoh did more evil to the people. Neither have you delivered your people at all. The Holy One said to him, Woe are over those who are gone and no longer found. That's a reference to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. As several times, and he refers now to the verses in which he made these promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But how? As Kael Shekai, not as Yudke Vavke. They didn't question my attributes. They didn't say, What is your name? None of them asked, What is your name? I said to Avram in Genesis 13, 17, Arise, walk through the land and the length of it and the breadth of it, until you, until you I will give it. And ultimately, he had to even buy a piece of land for burial for Sarah. And he didn't complain. He paid the full amount, 400 shekels of silver. And he didn't question it. He, didn't pro he did not protest that I failed to fulfill my promise to give him the land. I said I'm giving him the land, and yet he had to pay. So too with Isaac. Isaac... Um, was promised, sojourn in the land, I'm going to be with you, and I will bless you, in Genesis 26.3. And we all know that he built, he dug these wells, and the, the locals uh, uh, filled them with dirt, and there was all this, um, uh, let's say, uh, riv, uh, riv, uh, fighting and turmoil with the local population over, and you can see this in Genesis 26.20. And the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, The water's ours. And, of course, they, they fought over the water. And yet, Yitzhak did not argue or ask. Or he believed. He trusted Hashem. To Jacob, in Genesis 28, 13, The land upon which you lie, that I'm going to give it, God says. And yet, he also bought a, a place for the burial of Yosef. He also bought, and you can find this in... Um, where did I put it? Um, okay, I don't have it here, but um, here it is. You'll find this in uh, Genesis 33, verse 19, where he paid money for the, um, the plot. Okay. And then it, be, it ends with what we already said, how this was all done in order that, um, that, but Moses did question, what is your name? Neither have you delivered your people. And that's when God says, now you're going to see what's going to happen to Pharaoh, but you're not going to see the downfall of the, uh, of the 30, uh, 31 kings. So there's a comment over here when he says that, you know, there were several times that I, I revealed myself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as Kal Shekai. But they didn't question my, my character. As if to say, The way that Hashem behaved with the forefathers was not with the character traits of Yudke Vavke, which is the name Amiti, which is the true name. That's the name that is the trustworthy to fulfill his word because his promises that he promised them, they didn't have to believe in the name Havoya, but they named, they believed in the name of Kal Shekai because he, because he never promised it to them in their lifetime by saying it's going to happen to your children, then it would be understood, so they didn't have any lack of faith. The uh, Sitte Chachamim explains that the actual name, Yudke Vavke, is Ne'emanut Lekayem Es Haftachos Bekol Mikra. Af Im Yechatu. When it comes to Yudke Vavke, that's the name of God that will fulfill exactly what he says no matter what, even if the Jewish people sin. If Yudke Vavke says it, there's total Rachmanut. Ultimately, he will do it no matter what comes down the pike, even if the Jewish people sin. 
Whereas the name Shaddai is a kiyum of tacha rak in yuruim lekach. That idea of Shaddai, which means sufficient, is only fulfilled, he will only fulfill those promises if the Jewish people, whoever he promises to, is fitting mitzad ma'asehem, according to their deeds. If their deeds do not uh, fit the criteria, it's not going to happen. Um... So we do have a little bit of a question. Why Why were the Avos so believing? So, God said to the forefathers that with the Haftacha Shal Yerusha that um, this idea of the promise that your children will receive, will inherit the land, was not to be fulfilled. Avdum the Inoyotam Arbameoshana. It was only going to happen after four hundred years. Not right away. Like we see in Genesis chapter fifteen, verse thirteen. Im came loyalem klal makomli har her achra of Tafas Hashem. So there's not even a question why they would ponder or question God. So why would it bother us? Why compare the two? So the Be'er Sheva answers, and he says, You know what? They did have place. They could have, they could have um, questioned it. Because in their own lifetime, they did not merit to inherit the whole land. They got pieces. And it's like not like a teaser, but if God promised you the land, and then you had to pay for it, or, and just to get a little piece, it's a little bit uh, disheartening. But nevertheless, they did receive a small amount. At least what it was necessary for them to live on or to bury. And, right, they, they didn't receive it for free. They still had to pay for it. Nevertheless, they didn't complain. Can you imagine? You were promised... Maybe you, maybe your children. Okay, you heard about the 400, it doesn't matter. In the end, you just got a little bit and you had to pay for the full full price. And still they didn't complain. So that's a great thing to give honor to the to the forefathers for their belief. Now, af shenem ar legave me mariva. Now, the truth is, like I mentioned, uh, the verse dealing with uh, hitting the rock and not speaking to the rock You'll find in chapter 20 of Numbers, verse 12, right? God said to Moses and to Aaron, because you guys didn't believe in me, or you didn't cause them to believe in me, to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you're not going to bring this gen- this congregation into the land which I'm giving to them. He says this is not a steer. This is not contradicting everything we just talked about. Why? Because before the chet, before the sin of, what we're going to call the sin, of hitting the rock instead of speaking to the rock, it was already decreed on Moses. What was decreed? Shalo yireh. He wouldn't see what would happen in the war with the 31 kings. However, but it was still possible that he was going to come into the land. Remember, this is a seven-year war, and perhaps he wouldn't have lived the entire seven years. V'yamut koidim and perhaps he would die before they finished the, the conquest of the land whereas okay so that would have been in the beginning what we just said in our verse but later on in Bamidbar in chapter 20 verse 19 to 12 when the it was basically a final verdict that he wasn't going to go in the land at all. So it could have been in the beginning he was going to go in the land, but he wasn't going to see what was going to happen to 31 kings. Okay. Um, there's so many explanations. I, I, I won't have time, so I'm going to end with this little paragraph, and then we'll go into the third way. I think we should do it. So... This little paragraph just explains what's the difference between the name Yud Hey Vav Hey and the name Kal Shakai. As the the Gemara says, there are several times I revealed myself to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as Kal Shakai. 
So Rashi already explained that what? Birsha Kadish Baruchu Amar Lo Nichreti Laavos Bamidas Amitichali. So basically, what he's telling Moses is, I was not known by the forefathers by my true name, by my true attribute. Sho'aleha nikra ani Hashem. Because that's what I'm calling myself. Ani Hashem. Yud ke vav ke. Neman la amet devarai. That is uh, certifying the authority or completion, uh, the truth of my word. Sharei haf tachtim lo ki amti. Because behold, my promises to them on the Kal Shekai, I didn't fulfill. But now with you, this generation, this generation I'm going to fulfill. And what generation is it, believe it or not, from the time of Adam until the present day of Moses? It's, think about it, it's ten generations from when? Ten generations from Adam until Noah. And then ten generations from Noah until Abraham. And Moses is the sixth generation, 26 generations. The Yudke Vavke, it's time to reveal this important matter in the 26th generation, the gematria of Yud and Hain and Vavne is 26. That's not what he says, that's what I'm saying. But in the meantime, he brings down the Sitte Chachamim. He explains Yahavtacha Bashem Hashem, that this idea of the promises of the, to the name of Yudke Vavke is below Tanoi, without any conditions whatsoever, even if they sin. Masha'in came, Shem Shaddai, which is not the case by the name Shindalad Yud, where any promise made is Rak im Zoichim Mitzad Masehem. Okay, it's only going to be fulfilled if they fulfill the through their good acts. Then the promises would be fulfilled. Now we're going to go to Derek Shlishi. And for those who are on Skype and want to cut out, I get it. But uh, we're going to hopefully finish this in about 10 minutes. It could be done. Probably not. But we'll try. So the third explanation, God, HaShakadosh Baruch Hu wants to lefarsem. He wants to proclaim Ba'olam to the whole world. Ki hu yisbarach bora olamo yesh miyayin. He wants everyone to know there's such a thing called ex nihilo. That the world was created something from Nothing. Okay, now, what does that mean, something from nothing? Until this point, many Greek and Roman philosophers and scientists believe the world always existed. It always existed, according to them. And even according to whoever existed, right, in, in other words, within the tradition, that there was Adam until Moshe, could be. They also believed, right, that the world there was a creator. They believed there was a creator. But what does it mean, ex nihilo? Something from nothing. Now, I don't even like that translation, and you probably heard me say before, because yesh means mamashos. That means there's something, substance. Mi'ayin, from nothing, is not a good translation. So there's matter from energy or spirituality, or light, right? From God's ain self. Whatever ain self means, means there's no limit to what his energy and powers are so let's just call it spiritual ethereal something not tangible so the tangible world came into existence from the intangible if that's a word untangible intangible okay so yesh miyayin it was not yet widely known and spread out about the whole idea that the world was created chidush as something brand new something from nothing that's why God had I mean, he didn't have a need because God doesn't have any needs but he knew that we needed it right there was a ne it was necessary for God to spread the news to do it through these ten plagues the ten plagues is like a recreation of the universe Okay, it shows that he was the master in control the whole time from the very beginning. In order that everybody should understand and believe retroactively, so that everyone would know and believe that the world was created by God, something from nothing. 
like it says in before the very first plague, chapter 6, verse 17, before Hashem brings the plague of blood onto the, um, the Nile. It's, uh, chapter, it's chapter 7, verse 17, I said. Yeah. So said the Lord, with this you will know that I am the Lord. In Hebrew, Komar, Yudke Vavke, Bezos Teda Ki Ani Hashem, Yudke Vavke. You will know that I am the Yudke Vavke. Through these ten plagues. That's how it begins. And in chapter 18, verse 11, where uh, Yisro, when he comes to believe, because he heard all that happened in Egypt, he says, yidati ki godol Hashem mikol Elohim. I know that God is the God of all gods. He's the power of all powers. This is, many of the commentators have explained how it's possible through the ten plagues, which I have one chart here. It's very complicated. Oh, I don't know. Where is it? I have it here somewhere. And here it is. This is just one example how every one of the plagues match up with one of the ten statements of the creation of the world, and they also match up with the ten commandments of, um, you know, the famous ten commandments. So, Esar Dibrot. So, is, there's more than one explanation of how they all match up. I'm not going to pin down one, but this was adapted from Sefer HaParshiot Shmos, and I don't, I don't know who put it together, but it's a very interesting uh, example of how each one of these makos, one, each one of the plagues, emphasizes an idea of the mastery and control that Hashem has over the world, and it shows. Remember, there were no witnesses on day one through day five. I mean, only day six, and I wouldn't call that a witness. They were created after everything else. So to know that the world actually was created, yesh and something from nothing, would be quite difficult to comprehend um, unless you had a revelation like we all did in the 26th generation, as I mentioned uh, towards the end of the last thing that we talked about. Going back into the clear car, so he says that Al Kain Amor, that's why it says in Exodus chapter 6, verse 3, I appeared to the Avos as Kal Shekai. Now, what is Shekai? Shaddai means enough. When you think about what they talk about, the um, the concept of chidush yesh miyayin ex nihilo, the Big Bang theory. I think I'm not sure if it's a theory anymore. Comes to mind because before this theory or principle, everyone believed the world always existed from time from eternity. But no, there actually is such a thing as the world expanding, and God says enough. Enough that the world should stop expanding. Now that's a very interesting thing I also brought. Did I find it? Okay, I didn't bring it. Probably for good reason. Um, but anyway. This idea of Yud of Kal Shakai only proves or shows you that there was a creator. And there's such a thing that's called creation. But it doesn't really explain that there is such a thing as chidush, something new, something from nothing. It's only the Yud Kevavke that could do that, explain that. And that's why it says, Ushmi Hashem, that name, Yud Kevavke, I didn't make known to them. Kishem Zeshel Havaya, because remember that Yud Kevavke name is Moirish Kodesh Baruch Hu Mahave Yisakol. It teaches you and reflects that God is the all existence. All existence stems from Him. Akol Hayu Haviot Miito Yisbrach. All existence stems from God. Kizem Maamet Hachidush. This name Yud Kevavke, all existence, past, present, future. Old existence that certifies and authenticates this idea that everything stems from him, that there's such a thing as Yesh Miyayan, to say, Zulati, that there is nothing in existence that didn't come from him. So I'll just say in the positive everything that exists comes from Hashem. Yes, even the bad, right? Everything, everything, everything. 
And this is the, I'm going to just read in English from now on. I mean, there's no English here. I'm going to translate as we go. This is the answer that, he, that he's giving to Moses because Moses complains when he says, Lama hai ra'ota, why are you making it bad for the Jewish people? Even though already God said to him earlier on in chapter 3, verse 19, when he says, Ki lo melech mitzrayim la'loch, God actually says, you know, that Pharaoh's not going to let them go. I'm sending you on this mission, and he's not going to let them go. The only way he's going to let them go is when I give, give them a really hard, hard time with a yad chazakah, with a strong hand. The Kamakom wrote to Moshe, nevertheless, Moses, what was bothering Moses? He wanted to know the reason. Moses wanted to re know the reason why that Pharaoh's heart was going to become hard. In other words, why, God, are you doing this? Why are you hardening Pharaoh's heart so much? If it is in order to make all these plagues, so that's still a problem. Because God is all-powerful. He could just say, okay, let them go. And they'll go. I mean, what do you need the plagues for? What, what value is the plagues? And the whole idea of hardening his heart was to make the plagues come? Doesn't make any sense. I want to know why. What value? What is the reason? Why is there a need for all these plagues? Until God responds to him and says, you know, the reason for it is because Ani Hashem. I am Yudke Vavke Mahave Esakol. Everything stems from me. All existence stems from me. And this thing is not yet known in the world. I want the whole world to know, right? It doesn't yet understand that it's Yesh Miyayin. Even to the fathers, I never appeared to them except through as Kal Shakai, which only reflects this idea where I would say to my world, enough, but still, I didn't yet mifarsem, I didn't publicize the truth, the, the, the proofs regarding chidush, yesh miyayin. And that's why he says, my name is Yud K Vav K. I didn't make myself known to them that way. Therefore, I need to harden Pharaoh's heart in order to make these plagues. And the, the, each plague reflects one of the ten statements that God used to create the world. So that it's kind of like, I don't know, like not a reset button, right? You had the creation 26 generations before, but now's the time. And we're waiting until we hear this, because this is important. Now is the time. It's this generation that needs to know it. It's like a reset button. I want to make sure we're on track. Now, this is Hashem. Remember, He gives free will. So He's putting everything in the universe. And those with eyes will see. And we're going to say it like this. Im Tomer Ma Yom Miyamim. Why now? What is so special? This generation, why is it necessary to tell the world and spread the news, the gospel, the truth that Hashem created the world, Yesh Miyayin? Not fake news, the truth. Ma Tzorek Miyadizu. Why is this necessary, this information necessary now more than all the other previous generations? So if you look at verse 4, see, verse 4 says, Now, I'm going to fulfill my covenant, my, my covenant. Etam, with them, letate them es Eretz Canaan, in order to give them the land of Israel, the holy land of Canaan. Now think about this. If you are familiar with the very first Rashi of the Torah, and I beg you to go and look at it, this would be in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, which I also don't have here, but we'll have to go with it. The basically says, right, that uh, said Rabbi Yitzhak, why does the Torah begin with the book of Genesis? Why not start a book of law with the first law in the Torah, which is this is the first month to you. Start counting towards the Pesach offering and then the leaving of Egypt. When the nation became a nation, that's exactly where it should have begun. And the answer that Rashi is telling in the name of Rabbi Yitzhak is because in the future, right? <laughs> well, first of all, there's a Pasuk that's used uh, about my, my, my deeds, right? But that in the future, or if it ever would be, that the Gentiles would say, you are thieves, you are robbers. You will say to them, God created the world, and he created and gave whoever, whatever land he wanted to give to whatever nation, and it's true, he gave it to the Canaanites, and he's the one who took it away. Because in the meantime, you're calling us thieves, you're calling us um, occupiers. I heard that before. In fact, I've heard it 
almost every day since I've been alive, right? I was born after 1948. I was uh, born before 1967, but I was born after 1948. And even till to this day, right, it's still a very um, obnoxious, I have to say. Uh, but it's a good reminder. It reminds me of what Rashi is actually telling us through the Medrash. And look what the, the clear car says. If I, God, don't proclaim now, right, that it's me who created the universe, and I, the whole land, the whole world belongs to me. You know what the Goyim are going to say? You know what the nations are going to say? You are thieves. You are robbers. Unbelievable. Kibiyad hazacha tem kov shame. All right, so sheva sheva umos, that you took it by force. You guys are, I don't know, occupiers. I don't, I don't even know what words to use, you know. But basically, evil. You know, you are. That's basically what it's telling you. If you're if you're robbers, you're stealing it. It doesn't belong to you. Velokia behemashem. And guess what they would say. God himself didn't protest, which means there is no God. There is no God of justice. If people can just by force do whatever they want, and this we should keep in mind whatever is going on in the world, keep in mind, right? There is a judge and there is justice. No doubt. You have to know it and believe it. Hallelujah. In the meantime, we're back in the clear car. And he says, this is what they're going to claim. They're going to claim there is no... Uh, you guys occupied the land, you took it by force, and God didn't even protest. And then people would come to heresy and deniability about God by saying, and there is no judge and there is no judge, judgment. There is, there is, it's all hefker, right? Might makes right, do whatever you want. Like you explained on the words of Rabbi Yitzhak, and we kind of explained that already. Then tomorrow, if you say, "Hello, Gambi, me avos, hivtachtim letevem art," is it not that during the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, he promised to give them the land, v'lo asiti pursum chidush, and yet he did not uh, proclaim this idea of yud kevavke? Right? It was only the twenty-sixth generation, the generation going into the land of Israel. And again. Is it not that they were already promised? Why now? Shouldn't it have happened earlier? That's why it says, the Israel. When God says, I heard the groanings of the children of Israel, that was an awakening that this is the time of the redemption. So the COVID, this COVID that we talked about, this heavy weight of something is for us to scream out. Whether it's because of loss of business, loss of travel, people dying that we know, people dying we don't know. Whatever it is, people die all the time, but at this particular time, right, I can't even say, but you know that um, it's it's a really bad flu, right? We know that. It's, it can really uh, travel and uh, do a lot of, of damage. So the damage to the economy, the damage to schools, the damage to relationships, it, it, it has <laughs> A snowball effect, right? There's a lot of damage that can be done through this COVID. Okay? So, here we are. So, but God says, I heard their groanings of the children of Israel. Meaning to say that the Avos, they didn't need these signs because they didn't complain. Beloved Haki, because they were believers. They had such faith. They were not uh, in doubt. But when it comes to the umos, umos, they didn't need it. The, the non Jews didn't need it before this 26th generation because we were not fulfilling that promise. We weren't coming back into the land of Israel. But now, in that generation, Shani Shamati, Naka B'nai Israel, that I have heard the cries, the screams of the Jewish people. Now is the time to come into the land. And I think this is it. Guys, wake up. This is the time to come home. That's why I, God, found the need to explain now, to proclaim now, to get it out to the world. Through what? Through these ten plagues. 
that I am the one who's Yudke Vavke, who all existence flows from me, the Li Kalaretz, the whole land, the whole world, the whole globe belongs, the whole universe belongs to me, who be a Di Li Tenaretz, and it's in my hands, my ability, my rights to give the land Lemisha Ertza that I want. And that's why it says, Natati Ato Lechem Marash Ani Hashem, as the verse continues, and I will give it to you as a heritage, as an inheritance, as a heritage. I am Hashem. Why? Why you Kevavke? Lefi Ani Hashem, because I am God, Melchayde Seko, who causes all existence to come into being. Vani Asiti Aretz, I created the world, the Chola Sherla, and everything that's on it. Al came biyodi, therefore it's in my ability, litein oto lechem rasha, to give to you as an inheritance. Okay, so what we're going to leave with is a tremendous amount of faith, a, a tremendous amount of belief, right? That no matter what comes down the pike, right? Whatever we're going to call COVID, as we explained here, as the harsh reality of pains, <laughs> that's what it is. That it's in order to bring the geula sooner and quicker. Okay? With that, I don't want to end on a bad note. With that, we should really see the coming of a righteous Messiah, right? That we're anticipating all the time. And that we're going to continue to learn Torah and stop reading the newspapers and looking online with all these theories and conspiracy theories. We know the truth. And the truth is right here. This is the daily newspaper, La Havdil. I don't want to call it a newspaper, but you can get your daily news, right? You want to know what's happening in the world? It's coming through in a filter, right? Hashem is talking to you through the scripture, right? And we have the weekly Parsha, and you can open up the book to anywhere you want. Hashem is talking to you. Find a Chavrusa, learn online, learn on the phone, learn in person. I don't care. Just learn, right? So as Rat Hashem will continue. We'll see you next week. Shabbat Shalom, Chodesh Tov. And looking forward to the in gathering the exiles. Come home. Come home to Torah. A warm welcome home. <laughs>